Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 365 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. Check them out at performbetter.com. I'm your host, Anthony Rennan. The show notes are located at my site, continuefit.com or strengthcoachpodcast.com. All right, today for the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coaches Corner, spoke with Coach Boyle about how they try to maybe make it fun at MBSC. Talked about individualization with athletes in groups, mostly elite athletes, and why unilateral training doesn't equate to lighter loads. Just so you know, sound quality is a little bit low. Coach Boyle's in the car, so just had to do it. Uh, so I had to call him through Skype, kind of go old school on it. So uh, might be a little bit low. Hopefully uh, the editing can help that. All right, for the AG1 by Athletic Greens, hit the gym with a strength coach segment. Guys, AG1, 75, high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strength coach get your free year supply of vitamin d and five free travel packs today today i got on matt nickel legend in the strength conditioning community founder of biosteel sports no longer part of that but 26 years training professional athletes owner of paragenics uh systems in uh canada we talked about what objective and subjective measures he uses with athletes accountability and what tough love means to him or how he programs speed training, how he feels about competition in the gym, his input with on-ice training during his summer camp with his elite athletes, his approach with injured athletes in the off-season, motor learning considerations with training, how he adds variety without becoming a circus sideshow, that and so much more. Had a, I feel like this was a great interview, long overdue from Coach Nickel. All right, guys, don't forget, huge summer sale right now, Perform Better, best prices of the year on so many items, dumbbells, bands, sandbags, plyo boxes, rowers, ski trainers, kettlebells, med balls, ropes, so much more. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, guys, now time for the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv coaches corner with coach Boyle. You can try strengthcoach.com out for seven days for free, totally new format, user friendly, same great forum as always. Guys, go to strengthcoach.com for your seven day free trial. We are doing this old school again. Coach is in the car, so you're going to hear some background right now. Coach, how are you doing? I am doing well, Ian. Yes, uh, we were just saying the acoustics are not as good in the car as we're used to on Zoom, but we're going to make it work today. Yeah, guys, turn it up a little bit. Coach, I have on Matt Nickel today, long overdue. We actually brought up our uh, our, our karaoke, uh, not karaoke, but... Uh, our uh, music bingo, uh, music bingo. <laughs> uh, but uh, when we were in Maine, but um, Matt had a post on his site and I asked him about it too. Dr. Karen Purvis made the following statement. It takes approximately 400 reps to create a new synapse in the brain unless the repetitions occur in the context of play, in which case it might take even less than 25 reps. So I know you guys talk a lot about coaching and a lot about connection with people. And, you know, my favorite quote that I first heard from you is, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and part, of ma- making, part of making them know that you care is making them feel comfortable. What do you guys, what do you feel like you guys do to maybe make it fun or, a little more energetic at MBSC? Is it even a thought or like, what's the process that when you're teaching interns, when you're teaching young coaches, how do you go about talking to them about that? It's interesting. I don't think we really do. I don't think we think about making it fun because I get worried sometimes, particularly when you're dealing again with the, with younger kids that that, that immediately goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, but I also think we're trying to create really engaged, personable co- 
coaches, and I think that makes it fun. When you've got somebody there who's got good voice quality, whether it's in warm-up or whatever it is, I think that makes it more enjoyable for the athlete. There isn't sort of this droning on, oh, let's do this next. You know what I mean? Like that sort of effect. So I think people are having fun. The other thing is, I think when you're doing things like time sprinting, when you're doing flyouts, when you're doing med balls, when you're doing things explosively, it is more, I guess, more fun. People, it's more natural for them to think, hey, look at me kind of thing. And I'm having fun. You know, I'm throwing this thing as hard as I can. So I guess it's just keeping it, you're keeping it interesting, but I, I honestly, I wouldn't say for us there is any real intent for it to be fun. Okay. Yeah. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? That sounds, sounds kind of grinchy, but. No, I mean, I. But the thing is, when we look at mic'd up MBSC clips with your coaches, right? I mean, they are having fun. I think when they're out there and they're showing their passion and they're kind of, you know, talking to uh, some of the athletes and, and almost like kind of breaking their balls a little bit. Uh, sometimes or, you know, uh, not like that, like this, you know, kind of kidding around. That's another thing, like not taking themselves seriously all the time. So I think there is an element of fun in that coaching. But I think you mentioned a good point about plyometrics and med balls. I was telling Matt, I have two women who I've introduced these things to, and they're both athletes, you know, older, both in late 40s and early 50s. But I've introduced plyometrics and med balls to them. They have a blast when they're doing it. So we talked about you know, in this thing, there's there's an idea of variation. Uh, you know, varying the program as well can also make it fun. It just doesn't have to be, they don't have to be laughing. They just have to maybe not feel like it's boring. Yes, exactly. And that's, so I think it's the combination of those things. It's, you're doing fun stuff. I think for a lot of people, and I think you alluded to this before, when you get people skipping again and doing things like that, I think people will return kind of to a childlike state and they're, they are having fun. They're thinking, because fitness in general, and I've been very critical of our own profession, it can be super boring. Just look at how it used to be in terms of people riding the bike for 45 minutes or walking on the treadmill for 45 minutes or doing the Stairmaster. You can kind of look at it and think, wow, no wonder we weren't being too successful. We really weren't making this all this interesting. If you imagine a session of 45 minutes on the treadmill walking and then doing the machines in the gym, you think, eh, I don't know how many people are really clamoring to come back and think, wow, that was great. I had such an awesome time doing that. Whereas you bring people in, we did some files, we did some medicine ball drills, we did some skipping, some dynamic warm up, whatever, we did some ladder drills. I think that's very different in terms of the environment and, and the, thing, the actual things that you're doing. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. I think when people also feel like this is going to transfer, I think sometimes when you're on a machine, maybe, you know, you could be like, I could be doing this anywhere. I could go to Planet Fitness and do that. Um, so I think when they feel like they have a little bit more of a purpose and they're kind of doing things like an athlete, I think from the adult client perspective anyway, uh, I think uh, it makes a world of difference. So, Yeah, um, I, think, I think it does. Coach, um, another thing I kind of asked Matt about was, you know, and this is for your kind of elite and, and pros. How much do you really think about when, you know, when you have your pro guys, these guys, especially the hockey guys, they're coming in off and they have a short off season. Some of the guys that have been successful um, and, they're ba they're banged up. They got some injuries. Do you guys kind of think about asymmetries or athletes with injuries and kind of still put them in the group and maybe maybe kind of have them do a little bit different warm up or adding things that that's going to be beneficial for them or is it just homework or stay after or come early? How do you guys handle that? I would literally say all of the above in terms of. We have guys that are coming early and doing an extra warm up and extra hip stuff. We have guys that are staying after and doing extra. We're modifying all the time because the good thing with us and probably with Matt too is a lot of our guys are guys that we've known for a really long time. Yeah. So when these guys come back, it's 
how's your shoulder? How's your groin? How was this? You know, how was the season? What happened? And then you're automatically, and I think that's part of the whole kind of MBSC, CFSC idea of progression and regression. We know right away, all right, we're not going to do this. We're going to do this. We know we got to add this. And we know what that is, what we want to do. Okay, we're going to add some rotator cuff work. We're going to add some hip work. We're going to add some maybe some uh, body performance stuff for the guys who have hip problems. And we know that that's all going to take place. And maybe that means, all right, this guy, you know, he's had a back problem. He's not going to be squatting. So I always say to people, if you walked in, you'd think everybody's doing the same workout. But if you had really good powers of observation, you would realize, wow, everybody's not doing the same workout in terms of there might have been three different types of presses going on today in terms of some guys might have barbell bench press, some guys might have double hand climb, some guys might have close grip, some guys might have dumbbell flat bench, but everybody pressed. And, you know, it might be everybody, you know, trap bar deadlift, then you look and think, oh, there's two guys who did skater squat, did do trap bar deadlift, and then somebody else did flatboard lunge or whatever it was. So it's always ongoing, but I think good coaching makes you not notice that stuff. So I think if you were not really tuned into what was going on, you might think, wow, everybody's sort of doing the same thing. But if you were a more in tune coach, you would look and think, wow, there's a lot of individual variation going on here that's based on primarily, like you said, based on history here in history. Whether it's long standing stuff like, hey, we know this guy, we had a couple of guys, one guy who had shoulder surgery two years ago. I don't think he's touched the barbell this summer, you know, straight bar in terms of upper body stuff. And we had a couple of guys that have had groin and back things, and they're doing things a little bit differently because we know that they have a history of groin and back. And especially when these guys are getting older, they're going to be dealing with more and more little stuff in their in their process yeah yeah absolutely i know yeah those so some of those little things that are going to take them along and you know it's part of the routine that they're in and uh and that's where and matt had the same situation where a lot of these guys who are coming back um you know they know the routine they're gonna they're gonna know okay that when they can come in early when they can stay late and what are some of the things they're gonna have to do good stuff uh coach I want to. I know we've talked about unilateral training for years on this, but um, I want to just kind of for the newer listeners and um, for some of the people in the back who can't hear it. Um, unilat- Danny Foley posted unilateral training does not invariably suggest light load. Removing bilateral loading has not compromised or negated my intent to load athletes heavy. The two concepts can and should mutually exist. You wrote. People who actually try it realize the loads are often higher, not lower, when normalized for body weight. Problem is, most don't want to try. Can you expand on uh, this idea and maybe any research? I know Cass Barrett posted some research to that as well, that uh, that it's just not true. Right. Well, I think I always go back to the Alex Gutierrez stuff, and it's amazing how many people still haven't looked at that research and started to understand, like we talked about, you know, a guy, it goes back to the idea, a guy doing a bodyweight squat on one leg. So a one leg, a one leg squat, people, they, they use the term pistol, but that type of squat, we don't need to get into that. Oh, God, first in my head. <laughs> is effectively doing the same thing as a guy who's doing bilateral back squats with body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, and you do a one-leg squat, you're doing the same weight as you would be if you weighed 200 pounds and you had 200 pounds in the bar and did a two-leg squat. Most people can't even grasp the math because they haven't looked at it and they haven't made any real attempt to understand it. And those are the people who think, and that's what Danny alluded to, that it's loads. It's not. If you can get loads in the area of 50%, 50% body weight in a true one-leg squat, gives you a double body weight squat equipment. And to me, that and this is why when I do these talks over and over again, it makes me crazy because I look at someone and think, I can get you to experience the lower body training equivalent of doing a double body weight squat and 
all you're going to have to do is use half of your body weight. So the 200 pound guy is going to have to use 100 pounds, which isn't easy. As it, as it turns out, body weight squat is not easy. But when you look at that, I look at it and think, why would everybody not jump on this? And the reality is they, they don't because they're attached. They're attached to lifts. And this goes back sort of to the, the beer and ice cream thing in terms of there's just so many people who, who believe that this is the way. So it's, uh, it can be frustrating to me. It's great to see guys like Danny who are continuing to, to help to push the thought process forward. And I do think we're making a lot of progress, but at other times I go and watch people train and I think, uh, maybe not. (laughs) Yeah. And the thing is, is, I mean, when we say this, Really, we're talking about trainers and strength coaches who need to be uh, convinced because I know the stuff that I, you know, I do with some of the people, the you know, the adults, the, you know, but they're still athletes or, you know, one's training for a, a Ironman. I mean, all this single leg stuff. And she actually told me this morning, she said, you know, my times are the fastest they've been since I've been training with you. They've never been this fast. And my husband asked me, why do you think that is? And I, she's kind of thinks, she's like, I've never done these plyometrics. I've never done med, med ball stuff. She's like, I've never really done and focused on single leg weight training. And now she's feeling like those things are really translating. So I think it's easy to, to, to convince the people. It's the trainers we really need to convince. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. I think you're, you are 100% correct. I say that all the time. It's so easy to convince. Even the athletes, I, I've said this a hundred times. When I tell my, I get a football guy. Let's just say I get an NFL guy who comes in, and I say to him, "Just so you know, we are not, we are not going to put a bar on your back. We are not going to do a bilateral back squat." Invariably, those football guys either high five me, fist bump me, hug me. They're like, "Man, that's that's like music to my ears." And all of them have these horror stories of being made to to put four and five hundred pounds on their back, and so very few of them really enjoyed the process. But that's why we get into the whole idea, like you said. It's we're really speaking to coaches. I think the the trainees embrace this far faster than the trainers. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's really a shame. Um, coach, we are going to let you go. You're on the road. You're, uh, you're heading back to Boston. I don't want to, um, you know, uh, take too much of your time. So thanks for doing this. Thanks for taking the call and uh, safe drive. Thank you very much, Anthony. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. All right, guys, for today's Hit the Gym with the Shrank Coach segment, I have on. Maddie Nickel, long overdue. 26 years of training professional athletes. A lot of NHLers, so that's where my connection is. You guys all know I'm a huge hockey fan. Uh, he's the owner of Paragenic Systems in, based out of Toronto. Uh, he was the Leafs strength and conditioning coach and team nutritionist in 2002. Did that for about seven years. Actually, the founder of BioSteel Sports. No longer involved with them, but uh, kind of a, a if you if you can go online and re- read about his his story with that, it's kind of cool. Uh, he loves long walks on the beach. You know, if you're gonna put that in the bio, Maddie, I'm gonna throw it in there. And uh, candlelit dinners. We actually took a short walk on the beach up at Boyle's place. But <laughs> Maddie, thanks for doing this. Great being here. Great to see you. All right, I got my Maple Leafs hat on because um, I noticed that yeah. it's it's not just the Maple Leafs. It's more of a your boy. It's a, I was actually okay. that's that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. See, Matt Sundin. So funny story. My wife for Christmas, she gets me. She takes me to Toronto. She knows she wants to go to the. She, I wanted to go to the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's about maybe about ten years ago. So twelve years ago. I don't know. So she uh, she gets get. I open the present and she's like, I I. It's a trip to Toronto. And it's uh, you're getting to go to the Hockey Hall of Fame and everything. I'm like so excited, and and it's two tickets to a game. And she and it's it's the Maple Leafs versus the Canadians. And she goes, uh, I don't know, is that a good game? And I'm like, <laughs> it's Hockey Night in Canada. Are you kidding me? It's amazing. Uh, so and then it turns out to be Matt Sundin's night, right? And my buddy Greg Cronin was the assistant coach at the time. 
So I got to go in the locker room before the, you know, like in the Maybe. for the midday practice. So everybody, all the 13 jerseys were out there. So I just thought I had to throw this hat on because I know you work with Now, can, can you wear that hat outside your house in, in, uh, in your part of the country? Or is that going to be beaten up or what's the deal? Yeah, yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah. You know what's funny is when I do, I live in Indy now, in Indianapolis. Um, oh, and nobody cares. You're good. Nobody cares. No. Yeah. Um, uh, they, you know, the claim to fame is Wayne Gretzky's first uh, professional contract here for about three weeks before they sold him to Edmonton. But, sure. uh, but, um, you know, when you go, when you go to a game in New York, it's amazing when it, when an original six, a Ranger game, I'm an Islander fan, but when you go to a Ranger game, all the, anytime they play an original six, there's like 2000 jerseys of the other team. It's awesome. I love it. Cause yeah. people come in there's so many tourists there, you know, but uh, whether it's Detroit, Montreal, Boston, or, 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 uh, or the Leafs, man, you know, you get, a lot of jersey uh, opposite jerseys so well, those games were intense back in the day i can remember like running to the bus to go to the airport after the game in, in long island people pelting you with garbage and reaching through the fence to try to take a shot at you i'm like i'm the guy <laughs> making the protein shakes in the back like you know, <laughs> take it out on me you know yeah yeah exactly the long islanders yeah that that was an interesting because you guys had nowhere to go it's like the the hotel was right there at the coliseum yeah crazy that barn was awesome. Um, cool. Matt, I want to start out with, uh, by the way, everybody, I'm going to post a link to Matt's um, Instagram, uh, the Paragenics and his own, because there's some really good stuff on there. And, and what, Matt, one of the things you were talking about, there was a quote, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Uh, but you said this is often used as a cop out. And you said if you're going to be spending time in the weight room at all, why wouldn't you want to have some objective measure of success of your program? Totally agree. But I want you to go over uh how, what are your objective and subjective measures of your program? Yeah, absolutely. I feel strongly about that. And I think, you know, I'm I'm an older guy for sure. Like I said, 26 years. That's 26 years of me training pro athletes. I've been training people longer than that and I've been training myself a lot longer than that so I think that the mentality that I was raised on or that I came up on was you know all that matters is the stuff that can be counted you know all that matters is how many pounds are on the bar or what your 40 time is and all that kind of stuff so I think that that was obviously not in my opinion not correct but I think that you know at some point in time that sort of the, the script flipped and none of that mattered anymore. And it didn't matter, you know, it didn't matter. And the weight room was irrelevant. And I think that's obviously very wrong, again, in my opinion. But uh, I think that there's, there's, I think there's a way to find a kind of find a, a balance there or strike that balance in that I still believe it's super important to be strong. Now, strong, strong being a relative term, you know, the strong for an offensive lineman is different than being strong for a wide receiver, which is different than being strong for a, ice hockey centerman or, or, a, or a goalie or a ping pong player. I think, but I don't, I don't know any sport that wouldn't be enhanced in some way if strength levels are insufficient by becoming sufficient. I think we could hopefully, I would assume everybody listening would agree to that or you're probably not listening to this podcast. Yeah. Uh, my point was that I think there are a lot of things that, that we incorporate into our training that, that maybe are a little bit harder to quantify. And we, you know, one thing, uh, a guy who was a mentor of mine, Paul Check. You know, he sort of, you know, I don't know, he, it, to me, at least he coined that phrase about working in uh, being as important as working out. And I think that that concept of you could take that off on a tangent about, you know, emotions and spirituality and whatnot. I, I meant I'm, I'm talking strictly from a recovery standpoint. I think that there's a lot of things that we do, whether it's yoga or Eldoa or meditation or breath work, or there's, a, you know, a, a million variations off of that that are really hard to quantify those changes. But you know when they're happening. Athletes know when they're happening. You know, coaches like yourself, Mike, myself, that have been around all the time, you know when you see something that's happening. You know, even if you can't measure it or you don't really know how to quantify it, you know what's happening. So I think that's super important. But I think in, in my practice, we still track everything. Thing, and we, you know, and I, I would be also, I would be very, I'm, I, you know, I try to be really honest and candid too. We track a lot of shit that doesn't matter either. I just track, we just track everything, right? And, and yeah. sometimes, to be honest with you, and you know this, if you've been working with athletes for any length of time, if I have them sprint and, and, and that's, you know, speed training has been a huge part of my practice. I have a track and field background, so it's been a, a part of what I do from, ever since I've done it for 26 years, for sure, because it was a part of what I did. But I could tell my athletes, it doesn't matter what the sport is, you know, run as fast as you can. And if you are secretly measuring them and they don't know that's happening, 
and they're running their sprints. And then all of a sudden I pull out a timer, stopwatch, laser timer, doesn't matter. I guarantee you the times are faster. Guarantee it. Because elite athletes love to compete and elite athletes need to know what they're doing matters. And I think that that's why we track everything, even things that, I, that maybe are irrelevant, we track them anyway. And, and sometimes we find out years later that those seemingly irrelevant things are relevant. But uh, we still track, you know, things like I, I'm long winded. I'm getting back to your original question, I promise. But like we, we track things like, you know, the, the old basic stuff like like chin ups and trap bar deadlifts. And uh, not all of our athletes do back squats. So don't, you know, all the all the Mike Boyle fans don't freak out and go crazy. But some, <laughs> of, us still, some of our guys still do back squats. Sure. And, you know, we uh, le- less do less, less don't than do or sorry, less do than don't. I'd say but more than don't, but lots still do. We track that. We track our single leg squats. We track our sprint times. and We track our vertical. Some of the stuff, you know, we're using you know, force plates and dynamometers and, and, and some of those things we track with great precision. Some of them, uh, we know we use the iometer and, and we track things, you know, or, you know, or, you know, I, I think and, and everything in between. So I think uh, all that stuff, we track everything, even the stuff that might not be relevant. We track it anyway. Yeah. So your what are your thoughts like? It, it, like even Brian McKenzie and, and Andy Galpin, right? They wrote that book, Unplugged. Uh, we're getting crazy. We're getting so crazy. I got my Garmin watch on, right? Uh, uh, it's always about steps and and HRV and how well, you know, the aura ring and how well do we sleep? I mean, we can get overwhelmed. You've seen that change so much in your career and you are working at the highest level. Has that really, do you have to kind of rein those in a little bit? Absolutely. And now notice I, I, one important point of differentiation here. When I say we track, I mean, I track our, the staff tracks. I'm, I'm personally not, uh, and, and for, for a very specific reason, but I'm personally not a huge fan of, of not, of not everyone. Not there's, there's no, there's nothing I'm going to say to you that applies to everyone or that, or does not apply to anyone yep. for, for more than 51% of our athletes. I'm not a favor of them tracking with things like Garmin and, 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 you know, whatever the, whatever the flavor of the month is with wearables, unless that athlete has, has the ability to compartmentalize that and say, okay, you know what? My, my score was, I didn't have a good recovery score, but it's game seven of the playoffs. So what are you going to do? Not play? You know, and I, I think I was, I, I may have been, I mean, in Canada, I think I might've been, I don't know about the United States, but you know, we were using Omega wave technology for heart rate variability back in 2003. So that's a long time. That's 20 years ago we were doing this. And that's, I was, listen, I was leading the charge. I was so excited about this. I had found the holy grail. Nobody else had this secret technology. I was going to turn this whole thing upside down and revolutionize. But then what I found out is after a while, that was the problem I ran into. And you can appreciate this. Am I going to go to Pat Quinn, you know, the morning of game seven of the playoffs and say, hey, uh, Matt Sundin, uh, the computer says that Matt Sundin shouldn't play tonight. Pat would have, Pat would have, like literally thrown me out of his office physically, right? Like, so I think that understanding that if you have an athlete who's able to compartmentalize it and say, I understand that I had suboptimal recovery today, but I'm going to endure and I'm going to have a great performance tonight because I'm that, I know I'm that kind of athlete. I'm just going to make it happen. Then, then that person's okay. If it's an athlete that would be swayed, you know, by that score and it would, it would get inside and eat away at them. Then I'd rather them not know. That doesn't mean you still shouldn't track that stuff. That's, that's the job of the coach to track it then. Love it. Yeah, I saw a great lecture by a guy named Claude Harmon. His his whole all of his uncles were the famous golf coaches. And the, you know, his his uncle or his dad worked with Tiger. And he was saying there's three kinds of clients, especially with golf, because there's so much technology and information and uh, you know, club head speed and ball speed and distance and whatever. And he said the three kinds of people, one guy who wants to know absolutely every little detail and wants to talk to you about it. One guy who wants you to track it and say, listen, just tell me, track it. Just give me a a summary and then tell me what to do. The other guy, do not talk to him about it because it will be in his head. He'll be thinking about his right pinky on the backswing on the way down and, and you know, which way is he breathing in or out? So love that you do. You got to read the room, right? I mean, yeah, and you got to know, like the athlete should have enough awareness to know where they are at. As a coach, you should know. I mean, I knew of a, a world class lifter who had a coach that essentially was just there to execute the program that that guy himself had had written and designed. And basically, the whole point was, on this day at this time, you're going to put that weight on the bar. Don't ask me how I feel. Don't tell. Don't tell me what the weight is. I don't want to know what the weight is. The weight is wow. 
the weight has been calculated based on what I what I can do. I don't want to think about it. I'm just going to execute. So you do the thinking, you load the bar. I'm going to execute because that's what I do. And that was an that's an athlete who has had enough self awareness to know I have the I have the potential to psych myself out. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let that opportunity arise. I'm just gonna be zoned in on whatever's on that bar. My coach knows I'm capable of doing. I trust him. I trust myself. I'm gonna get it done. So I think with wearable tech. If you're able to dissociate yourself from that, that's great. If you can't, it doesn't mean you still shouldn't use it, but maybe there's a way that your coach can monitor those results and let you know when you need to back up. Yep, yep, good stuff. Hey, I'll, let's segue that into some other coaching. And you were talking in one of your uh, lectures on social media as well. With uh, You were pointing out to the guys, like there's a certain amount of accountability and tough love that 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 we as coaches, we need to make sure that we are um, expressing to to our our athletes and uh you were talking about you know we don't care where you're at uh we're not going to judge you but we're gonna, we want you at a certain point uh so just talk to us about that piece of coaching and i think it's a it's a part of coaching that a lot of us because we want to be friends with our clients or our athletes uh you you have high level like your camp in the summer has 25 of the uh, nhl players and 25 of the best amateur players uh, they only get accepted and there's only 50 people in there, but it's huge. And you, you know, uh, you know, you talked about it too. You want your people to love you, right? We want to, we want to be friends. We want them to come there and, and love coming there, but we got to have that tough love. What does that mean to you from a practical standpoint with your athletes? Yeah, I think for me, it's the hardest thing. I, I, don't, I, I'm, I don't think anybody would get into our profession if you didn't like people, if you didn't, if you, if you weren't an empathetic person, and you didn't care about people and want the best from them. Otherwise, why the hell would you do this? There are lots of other ways, you know, and it, it, anyway, it wouldn't make sense to me personally, but maybe there are a few psychopaths that just like really like getting up early and, and not eating and living on coffee and whatever it is. But, uh, but I think for me, that's the hard part is that sometimes you have to have those tough conversations and you got to tell people that stuff that they don't want to hear. And it's, it would be much nicer to just be like the regular, not knocking personal trainers, but the ones that, you know, the commercial gym said, Hey, good job. Great job. Good job. Good job. Good, what good job you know you told them to do 10 they did seven you told them to go slow they went fast you told them to keep their back straight their back was rounded what do you mean good job that's not a good job that's exactly it's the opposite of what you told them so i i have a problem with that uh and i think that that comment about you know we're we're going to let you know where you stand the, you know i think after and there, there's some research on this too but i think after the age of maybe six or seven years old if you're the if you're the shortest kid in the class you know you're the shortest kid in the class. If I tell you that you're really, really tall, it doesn't make you. It doesn't make you tall, right? Like, so in our gym, if 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 an athlete is is falling behind where they should be, that's the key. Where they should be, you know, we've got some incredibly strong guys in our gym. We've got you know guys like Tom Wilson, you know, Mason Marchman, who people, maybe some people don't realize these guys are you know deadlifting well over 600 pounds if they wanted to, if they wanted to, if they was not yeah. something we're pushing for. But my point is. I don't, I don't expect everyone to be able to do those things. That's not the point. But if you're falling behind where you should be, where, where you're capable of being, it's our job to let you know that. And it's, but, and, it's, and it's our job to help you get out of that position and get better. And you need to know where you stand because it's not, you know, this is not house league, unfortunately. This is, this is professional sports. And you can be the nicest guy. I'm, I'm, I'm a nice guy. Ant, you're a nice guy. We're hardworking guys. No one's offering us NHL contracts. Uh, maybe I can't speak for you, but <laughs> no one's banging down my door offering me $10 million to do anything these days. So I, I might be a nice, hardworking guy, but the, the fact of the matter is I can't get the job done at the level that needs to get done at. So that our job, you know, if, if they've hired us, there's an assumption that, that they would like us to coach them and they would like us to be honest with them and they would like us to push them to be better. So I make sure that I'm really clear day one with any new client, like, you got to let me know what, what are your expectations of me? Here, here's how I like to coach. Here's my style. What are your expectations of me? And how do you like that feedback delivered to you? Some guys, you know, you got to be very careful about singling some guys out uh, in the moment. Some guys want you to be hard on them and yell. Some guys don't want that. So you, that's the, the art, as you said, you know, there's that art and science of coaching. That's the art. But you still got to deliver that information. Absolutely. I love it because I think it goes... It segued nice because of the app, you know, that this is again why we need those objective measures to start. We have to know that. And there's been so many arguments over the uh it's one thing we did here on the podcast. We, Gray Cook was on the podcast from for, for a long time. And and Gray and I always kid around 
when we see each other, like we we're really just putting fires out because everybody always had a hard time. And always he was just saying, I just want people to have a nice starting point, you know, like here, you know, we're not we're not trying to end world hunger. We just want them to start have a nice starting point to about movement, right? And I think that's where the you know having some of these measures of success come, uh, are are super important. But um, let's talk. Um, I watch so you have some great videos, by the way. Whoever I. I, I'm I'm pretty sure. Are you doing the? You're not editing those videos, right? Dude, I don't. I I, I barely know how to use my phone. I got, <laughs> okay, an, I, I got go. an iPhone two years ago, so that's okay. You never know. know. Yeah. You never know. Um. So great videos, and you know, I could watch one of those videos. I got a great sense of your speed training program. I saw some like resisted running with chains. I saw some time sprints. I saw some uh partner stuff where guys are are you know working almost like they're uh a wide receiver and a and a and a cornerback working against each other um can you just talk about your philosophy you know coach boyle talks about a lot of you know he times everything he's very big on that every episode we'll probably talk about it uh what is your philosophy you've been doing this a long time where are you right now with speed training well yeah i think it's a little bit funny to me again i come i i, I never played hockey i i i can barely skate at all so but I, I come from a track and field background uh, and I played football, which obviously there's a huge, you know, speed training is just, you, it's not, it's not optional. That's not, that's not a philosophy. It's like you have to do it. Right. Yeah. So it's always been odd to me that that's a new thing in hockey. Cause I never, I never understood why you wouldn't do it in hockey, but I think that's, there are some disadvantages about coming into a, a sport, not knowing the culture, the nuances. That was one of the advantages of doing it is that, even when people weren't doing it, I've always been doing it. And I didn't understand why I, I didn't understand why you wouldn't do it. Uh, so it's always been a part of what we do. And, and, and we, we change it up and we, you know, I, I read the research and uh, you know, we're, you know, some years we're, we're the resistance is lighter than it's heavier and then it's back to lighter. And we're always messing around and we're, and we're looking at our numbers and seeing, you know, how much did it matter? Like it used to, you know, it used to be 10% resistance or, not more than a 10% uh, decrease in your time. And then, then all of a sudden it was, you know, crazy heavy. You're, you know, running with a, a school bus behind you. And now all of a sudden it's back to media. I don't know, but, I, we're, but we all, we are always looking at it. And, and regardless, we're always sprinting. And, and I think the timing is super important. Like we said, why wouldn't like when people are talking about not timing sprints or not, I mean, there's a reason why they put numbers on the plates and numbers on the dumbbells. Like hey, otherwise you just go outside and lift up rocks or do whatever. But, but I would say that we don't get hung up on, I mean, we used to, we used to hand time everything. Uh, and then we had the old school, uh, I don't even remember the name. You, everyone, the, there was only, there was only one timer, you know, perform better, sold them. That's, you know, that was it. You, you either, you either got a stopwatch or you got those. And then we had different laser timers and now we're onto a different brand. And some, some days we're running on a track. We've got a beautiful Mondo track, except when it rains, we don't do that. And then we're running on, you know, concrete. Sometimes we're on AstroTurf. Sometimes we're on, old school turf sometimes we're on field turf the times all change a little bit so i don't get hung up too much on that uh but the whole the the concept of moving as fast as you possibly can you know if anyone who's excited about velocity based training well there there's velocity based training right there there there's your if you're a conjugate guy there's your dynamic effort it doesn't get more dynamic than that what do you what are your thoughts on uh this idea almost like feed the cats idea of like of of like posting the times and letting everybody know like talking about the competition are you going uh, uh Mike Mike will usually won't do two guys at once because then the race he doesn't want to, to race each other that's when they get hurt but when they're racing against the clock it's a little different what is your thoughts on that Yeah it's good I don't know it's a good I, I'm I'm always um I'm always a little bit hypersensitive about uh, we, 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 all the guys in the gym know their results. Everybody knows their own personal result and they know everybody else's result. I'm a little hypersensitive about, uh, you know, publicizing those results because I, you never, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know if the athlete wants that information to be public or not. I'm not doing it for Instagram likes. So yeah. it would be, you know, if I, if I get a whole bunch of likes, I'll feel cool for 30 seconds. But if I piss off a, a client, uh, and that's not something they wanted. That's a little bit more detrimental to me. So um, I'm 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 a little hypersensitive about that. Although I do see the value for sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's bad to do. I just personally don't do it. Uh, I understand Mike's point about not racing. Although I would say we actually do do that. Uh, we try to control it. You know, we we don't we don't do any any long distance racing, but we do some short. We're, everything we're competing every day, every day. Whether it's whether it's head to head in the moment whether it's you know everyone everyone knows what everybody else lifted today and yeah. i think I, I 
I think it's important, although I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, usually reluctant to argue with Mike about much of anything, but uh, I would say that's one where I, I completely understand it. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly wouldn't be doing a hundred meter dashes, but I, I, I would also tell you that that happens. We have guys every year, there's a couple of them, I won't name the guys, but I mean, they probably won't listen, but if they do, they know who they are. We got a couple of guys and these are, these are NHL star NHL players that have a hundred meter dash race every summer. And it's a, uh, every, like every summer when they show up, it's like, Hey, you know, you tell me when you're ready, it's happening. Like we're doing it. Like it's I'm four and three, you know, I, you got me last year, but like last year was different because, you know, we went all the way to the Stanley Cup final. <laughs> this year. I'm, you know, this year I got you. Like these guys are going to compete. That's what they do. Yeah. You know, so I think yeah. you got to be smart and you got to control it and don't do stupid things. But you know, I, I think it's just, it's the nature of the beast. Show him the Kevin Hart video of him racing some <laughs> NFL guy right now. <laughs> like, see, this is what happens guys. Um, you had a great post about motor learning. So you were saying in his studies on motor learning development disruption, motor learning expert Richard Schmidt observed that the acquisition of a new motor pattern in a closed motor skill generally required three to 500 reps to induce neuroplastic changes in the brain. Conversely, correcting a faulty movement pattern that is becoming ingrained can require three to 5,000 reps to change. So um, look, you, you're... The, the, we'll just go by your camp for now, okay? Twenty-five amateurs. I know the pros are coming back. You got you got a lot of repeat business. The amateurs, a lot of times, you probably have some newer guys who have those those bad patterns. What are you doing from the perspective of when you're working with that many people? Sometimes it's really hard to individualize. So, talk to us from a coaching perspective. What are you doing with those athletes that you do feel like? Man, we got to work on this. These guys are coming from, uh, you know, maybe some bad training or no training or, well, no training would be good. Some bad training. Yeah. I mean, we, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. We're, we're, we're big on this. We coach. Our, my staff, our, our team at my facility, we coach and we, we, we coach the hell out of them. Like, and we coach, we coach their warm ups, we coach everything. And, uh, you know, the counter, you know, the, the counterpoint or argument to that is about, you know, the exploratory method of learning and, allowing athlete to do reps and make mistakes. Absolutely 100%. Asterix, if they have a loaded barbell in their hands or on their back, I, I'm not cool with that. I'm not cool in like, hey, let's see how it goes and let them find out what it feels like to, to smash their back in half. So we're not, we're not doing that with loaded weights. With our, with our movement, our dynamic warmups, absolutely we allow for variation. And, and who's to say there's you know, one, you know, one and only one way to do anything, but I would say for the most part, we're coaching everything and we're, we're not shy to take an athlete and completely regress them. Everybody else might be doing sprints and plyos and heavy lifting. And we, have, we might have someone in the corner doing, you know, dead bugs and bird dogs and side bridges. We're, and I'm not, I, 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 I and not, this is not to say that I'm immune to the pressure of losing a customer because they don't like the training or I'm not immune to the pressure of the NHL season is starting in four weeks and this guy feels like he's not where he needs to be. However, I, I can only be I can only be me and I can only be honest with with the athletes and say listen, this is what you need you know this is really what you need and and you have to, like there are certain things that I can let slide and there's certain things I can't and there's certain things that say listen, if we don't fix this yeah yeah you can yeah you can do your conditioning and yeah you can sweat and you can make your legs burn or whatever but if you don't fix this you're going to be right back to the reason that you came here in the first place there's a reason why you're here if you everything was perfect and your body worked perfectly and you scored 100 goals last year and everything is great. You wouldn't be here. So why the, you came here for a reason. Trust me on this. So we, we coach all that stuff. Yeah, I guess that similar answer to the question I was going to have. You had a Stanley Cup finalist uh, on the Panthers who, who's been with you for a while. And he had a torn labrum in the playoffs and he was going to miss three months. I know he was working with the, uh, the Eldo guys, too. I'm having Dan Hellman come on soon, too. But what from that perspective, when a guy comes in like that, is he part of the group or is it like, Hey, you're gonna have to skip this one. There's not enough that you could do. What will you do with a guy like that? Who's coming in off the of surgery, torn labrum. They're supposed to miss some time. Uh, what can you do with them? Yeah. I mean, that's not, I mean, we, we have clients that, that sustain injuries. We have a lot of clients that come to us specifically for that reason. They have other, they train with other guys. So they, they may love their strength coach and love their trainer, love their speed coach, whatever the case may be. We we've kind of developed a bit of a niche with rehab. So a lot of times they'll come and they'll say, hey, you know what, if, if, if you like it and you want to stay, we'd love to have you. But also, if we patch you up and get you back 
and you go back to where you came from, that's cool too. We're just happy to do our job, whatever, you know, whatever role you yeah. need us to fill for you. So, uh, but in the case of that in the summer, that's pretty normal. I mean, in, in a typical summer, you know, I'd say we've, we've been pretty fortunate. We've been in the last 12 years, I think we've had 11, you know, guys win a Stanley cup and we've had guys go to the finals and not win. And those guys start their training in July or the middle, I mean, I mean, barring trips to Vegas or whatever else they might do, maybe it's the middle of July, but like, and other guys start their training in May. So at any point in time in the summer, we've got guys that are at all different stages of the summer and that's okay. Not a hundred percent, but a lot of it kind of funnels down to where they're all kind of at the same point by September. But that being said, it, you know, if you came into our gym in August, you're going to, you're going to see guys that are you know doing sprints and plyos and hard conditioning. You're going to see other guys that are entering into their, you know, their max strength phase. You're going to see other guys that are, you know, trying to restore range of motion and that's it. And, and, and all over the map. And, you know, the, the guy that you're referring to in general, our job is not to get him back into an NHL game. In that case, it was okay. We've got to get him as good as we can get him. And then once training camp starts, he's going to be back with his team and, and that's, and that's okay too. So, you know, we've, I, I think being, being in this game for a long time and having worked on both sides, being a team guy and being a private guy, uh, we try to be supportive of, of, of the team guys and we're respectful when they when they trust us to to have one of their players for a month or two or whatever it may be. And then every once in a while, some of these teams say, hey, you know what? We're slammed. We got a lot of guys that actually makes more sense. You just keep him until he's ready to start to return to practice and then send him back. And 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 anything in between, we're good with. Yeah, and I know you have a, a great relationship with a lot of the NHL strength coaches to kind of kind of keep that communication, those communication lines open. Um Let's go back to the the, the motor learning stuff. Uh, you had another post about uh, kind of expanding on this idea. And Karen, Dr. Karen Purvis made the following statement. It takes approximately 400 proper reps to create a new synapse in the brain unless, this is awesome, the reps occur in the context of play, in which case it may take even less than 25 reps. So um, now this is a tricky piece. You talk about like you can devise novel and innovative exercise variations. I was talking to you earlier. I think Jeremy Frisch is a master at this. Uh, I personally, I try to use like something like uh, different tools that people will see and be excited about. Joe Banya has the 3D strap, the what's that strap? I'll use David Weck's RMT clubs because it's so different. Even the stick mobility because they're orange. Uh, with some of my older folks, just med balls and plyos. Are, I have a, a couple of young ladies now. They're, they're in their 40s and 50s, and they're introducing them to this little kind of plyo uh, uh, med ball circuit. They're absolutely freaked out. They love it so much. It's so new to them. So it's great. And I know you have like like somebody like Jonna Webb and her brand of yoga. Uh, what are some things that you're doing to make it as fun as possible? And be careful of not, you know, ha being a circus act with the exercise variations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if I... If I look at my clientele right now, you know, I've got I've got NHL hockey players that I've had since they were, you know, Tom Wilson or Tyler Sagan since they were 16, 17 years old. You know, like mm -hmm. these guys, you know, some of these guys have been training for 14, 15 years. You could make, I mean, theoretically on paper, you could make a case to say, we can just do back squats every workout and we will vault, we will undulate the load and the tempo and the percentages. And uh, you could just do that one exercise for your entire career. Can you like now? And 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 I and you could make a very very defensible argument about why you could just clean or squat or snatch or whatever. And power lifters do that, and Olympic lifters do that. But you, that's not going to fly. These guys are going to get bored. You have to find some way to capture their attention and their intention. Uh, and and I think that, as you said, you got to make sure that you're not doing it just for the sake of doing it and doing circus tricks. That, that's not the point. But Finding some way to make it novel uh, drives that drives that curiosity, drives that attention and attention, and drives that spark to to want to want to you know explore that. And you know, I, I say fun loosely. I mean, I'm not sure. Yeah. I I have a lot of fun in my weight room. I'm not sure my athletes have quite as much fun as I do in my weight room, but you know, it's <laughs> fun for me. But I think at least to keep that the stimulus a little bit novel is important. And uh, you know, you talked about Jer Jeremy Frisch is amazing. I think that. The the sad kind of maybe kind of one of the sad things is that a, a lot of those ideas that I get and I've, I've, I've you know taken a ton from Jeremy for sure but I, I went to teachers college and I actually was a teacher I taught both elementary and secondary phys ed as as well as a classroom teacher but that stuff that should be happening on a regular basis in schools it's not you know should be happening 
in their neighborhoods. It's not, right? So when you do it with athletes now, it's like it, it, it makes you cutting edge and revolutionary. It's like this this is stuff that Anthony, you were doing and I were doing when we were kids, like British Bulldog and Red Rover and tag games. It's something I did and learned as an educator. And I think that that piece of my education was certainly as valuable, probably more valuable than any of the other information I've learned about percentages of one rep max in a, in a yeah. squat rack or any of the other stuff. And Jeremy talks about that all the time. He's always showing books from the 20s and 30s, and oh, physical absolutely. education books, right? Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, so when I had five iron, my, my gym, working with golfers, I used a hitting bay with sessions, right? Because I believe that, you know, when we get like a new mobility, uh, so we get we gain some new mobility, this momentary mo mobility, or even a new understanding of the movement when they're kind of like, oh, okay, now I get it. Uh, I kind of want to capture that by reinforcing it with the actual sport movement. So I would, you know, in this case, it was the golf swing. I would say, you know what, Maddie, go hit hit five balls, not 100. Go hit five and just think about all that stuff we were working on. You post videos of your boys on the ice, and um, you seem to be active in what's going on in those sessions in your camps, uh, in the summer camps. Is there a specific process that you have behind the integration of kind of the off ice on ice stuff? Yeah, and uh, to me that's essential, and I couldn't I couldn't do it any other way. And I think that um, in, in my situation, I'm not I'm not a hockey coach, uh, but so I employ uh, you know amazing world class coaches. We've got you know NH NHL hockey coaches will come and coach at our camp. NHL skills coaches will come and coach at our camp. You know the power skating coaches that work with all these guys in the NHL work with our guys here. It's it's and, and but that to me is essential because you can't do either of these things in isolation. And that was always my, my frustration when I worked in the NHL is that I had, I had no involvement in, in what was going on on the ice. Now, now when a player was injured and they were out of the lineup for a significant amount of time, then I did, which was great. I love that part. But as soon as they were deemed healthy enough to practice, you had little to no involvement in what happened on the ice. And it, it it's essential to me. Now I would never, I would never, uh, you know, pretend to, 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 know enough to tell my my coaches which drills that they have to run or how they should go that that's not that's not my place but my place is to say hey today on this day in this week of this month of the cycle of training that we're doing please do not do a b and c and whatever you do make sure you do d e and f outside of that whatever way you want to coach it whatever drills you think will achieve that goal that that's totally up to you and it gives i have they have that autonomy but it's it's super normal for us to see athletes who, when when I didn't do that, when I didn't integrate the two of them, that would come to us. You know, we got a big you know lower body workout plan today, and they just got bag skated, and they're halfway through their warm ups for whatever squat lunge, blah blah blah, and all of a sudden now they're on the shelf because they strained a groin, strained a handy, strained a hip flex, or whatever the case may be. That's not that the exercise was bad. Not, and it does, I'm not even saying the bag skate was bad, but those two things should not have coincided on that day. We had, an, we had an issue uh, a week or two ago where uh, I, I happened to wander out on the ice just to see how the guys are doing. And one of the guys, you know, just remarks like, hey, uh, you know, my hip's been hurting me a lot. You know, how long? Oh, I just started yesterday. It's really bad, though. I can't, can barely, you know, every time I skate out here. Well, if, if I didn't know that, so immediately now we can cut the practice, change the workout for that guy, go back in, get treatment right away, do a rehab session, not a workout right away. Next morning he walks in feel fantastic, feel the best I've felt in a couple of weeks. But without without the proximity of the facilities being there and being able to monitor that, he might go back into the gym. Because he's a hardworking guy, he's going to do the workout that he was told to do, even though it's not the right thing for him to do. Now, all of a sudden, we made the injury worse. Now we're two weeks on the shelf instead of, you know, 12 hours on the shelf. So it's it's crucial for me to be integrated. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Love that you got that. Now, going back to the speed question, I forgot to ask you this. When... Uh, since you do have the ice, are you doing, because there, there might, I don't know if there's any controversy over it, but a lot of people talk about, hey, just because they're fast on the land doesn't mean they're fast on the ice. Are you timing, are you taking some of that data as well, speed data, or doing making sure they're doing some speed drills on the ice as well in that camp? Uh, we, I, when I was with the team, we absolutely did that. Absolutely, all the time. Um, now we do not do it, at least on not on any regular sort of basis, and not because I don't think it would be valuable. I think it would be valuable. 
The problem is just the, the the number of players we have, the cost of ice, and the availability of ice. The amount the, to be able to get an, I mean, it's just a harsh reality. Yeah. I, I'd like to think that I'm, you know, after 26 years, I can, you know, walk around, uh, you know, walk into any arena and get what I want. But that's certainly not the case in Toronto. It's, uh, you know, it's a it's a seller's market if you own an arena, and lots of people want ice. So it's not a it's not a regular part of our training. Not because I don't think there would be value. I think there really could be value. It's just it's something that we can't get enough ice time to do just just that portion of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had a great post on Rick Barry, and you're yeah. talking about he had a ninety percent free throw free throw shooting average over a fourteen year career. He was the eighth all time greatest free throw free, free throw shooter in the NBA history. Now people don't know that he used to use like a granny style, so underhand, and it worked for him. Um, and there was actually some research on this, and it went the one that even went so far to suggest that NBA players who consistently shoot below 70% with the conventional style could possibly improve their shooting percentage by as much as 13% to switch to underhand. Nobody does it. Will Chamberlain tried it for one season, and he had his best free throw shooting percentage of his career, but he switched back because he said it made him look like a sissy. Shaq said the same thing. Uh, one of the worst free throw shooters in history. When He said he would rather shoot negative percent than shoot that way. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, look, we have to uh, uh, take some of these things that might, you know, look different or, uh, you know, change things, not only from the athlete's perspective, from, but from the, the coach's perspective. So you you said at the end of the post, how does this apply to your training? How does this apply to your coaching or any aspect of your business or life? So I just want to turn that question around to you. How do you feel like when you, when you hear this, what are some things that make you think about your coaching and maybe things that you want to reevaluate or change or you're happy about? Tell me about the great question. I mean, and I I would say, to be honest with you, I I go through that daily, (laughs) sometimes multiple times per day, but certainly we're like, I look at, you know, I, I think I was a very early adopter, at least in the hockey world of velocity based training. I was, you know, doing that in 2003 uh, in season. And it made it made sense for me in season because I was so afraid of overtraining anybody in season. And I was so afraid of and this is again, I was not not to say that I am no longer a a proponent of squatting and cleaning and deadlifting and snatching, whatever, but I was very much more so at that time in my life. Everyone, everybody must be able to squat X number of pounds. Otherwise, you're a horrible human being and you should be embarrassed, right? So, <laughs> yeah. but in season, we were VBT all the way because I was afraid of hurting anybody in the gym in season. And then as soon as the season was over, we stopped doing that because we needed to like put pounds on the bar and, you know, make me feel good about myself because of how much weight my guys could lift. And I, I think that's something now we, you know, we're, we're, a uh, not exclusively, but we're, we're a year round BBT system now, you know, that's something that, uh, again, we just, I, I didn't have a good reason for not doing it. I just didn't do it. You know, there's a lot of things with our training, you know, we used to, everybody must do this X, everyone must squat. And, you know, you've got to have your squat and your assistance. You've got to have your bench and your, so there's a lot of those things that I just don't do anymore. And I don't, I, I mean, I, it took the courage of just not doing it. Um, I think, you know, understanding the importance of rest and recovery. And I can remember that, I used to have an unloading week and we, you know, we used, we calculated the percentages and back then every single guy had their program card. Each guy had their own unique program with the percentage of weight. It told them exactly what weight lift on every day. And there was some value in that for sure. Not, and if you do that, not knocking it, not, there were some things about that system that are better than the way I do it. Now, the one thing that wasn't better is that it really kind of killed that competitive and camaraderie in the gym. It kind of killed that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but the other problem was when we did our unloading weeks, and if you've worked with hockey players, you can appreciate this. You come in and tell them to do three sets of 10 reps with a weight that they're capable of doing 20. They're like, what, what the hell are we doing? Like, I, I, I'll just do 20. Like, yeah. <laughs> hey, we're going to do half the work. Okay, but can, I'm just going to do a couple extra sets. Like, they just couldn't. And I remember it was probably 2005 or six. And I was strong every year. So about five for five years, I'm struggling with this and no one's listening. They're like, okay, we'll do your stuff, Matt. And then we're just going to rip off. Uh, we're going to do a couple drop sets or we're going to do a push up pyramid or some other bullshit thing that they had because they were addicted to that feeling of crushing themselves. So 
for three days, I locked the gym. So okay, that's it. We're closed. Gym's locked. Can't come in. I mean, if you want to go to 24 hour fitness, I can't yeah. stop you. But, and guys came back and they were a little, they were a little perturbed at the time, but they came back and everybody, you know, some guys got, you know, no one got worse. And a few guys actually got better. And I thought well, that was cool. And the following year we took an entire week off, which was some guys are very upset. I don't have a cottage. They're like, Oh, you know, like, Hey, you go to the cottage. Like, what's this all about? No, it's not, it's not about me. It's about you. And we stuck with it. And all of a sudden now is this, you know, like this, I don't know if it's super compensation or, or just, we stopped beating them up and making them get up and not sleep and get up early. So that really hammered home to that, that point of the importance of rest and recovery for me. And that's something that we've, we've stuck with. Uh, we really take that very seriously. Uh, we, when we work hard, we work really, really hard, but when we rest, we rest. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking about that reminded me about a conversation we've been having a lot of the guys actually had Sean Skane on uh, for part of the episode and uh, Mike Potenza as well. And just talking about this idea, what, so there was this question and it came from a track and field thing. When should the athlete lift? So should they, the lift be done before practice? So, because then the lift is might hurt some of the motor skill learning right or should it be done after the practice because then now there's potential to get hurt we're not really going to be as fresh as we can what are your thoughts on that with again you have the summer camp where you have both you have guys going on the ice so you have to think about that it is important in the off season really i would say a lot of the most important thing is to kind of recover and get you know keep that strength keep that power uh what are your thoughts on that piece I think you have to differentiate between in season and off season. And I would say in the off season, in the first half or the first phase of the off season, we always lift first. If we're going to be on the ice, the lift takes precedence over the work on the ice. When we get into the second or the, or that second half or the second phase of our summer, it's the opposite. Yeah. And the reason why, I mean, to me, it's just sort of common sense that whatever's most important should be done first. When you have the freshest, you know, your freshest mentally, physically, your energy stores are high. So at the, at the start of the summer, uh, we still are trying to really, really fill that bucket of strength in the gym, you know, our speed work off the ice, whatever we can do, because I know that they're largely not going to get that or probably not, you know, as much or to the quality that they should in season, right? So we try to get that then. As we get closer to the season, the on-ice work is, is absolutely more important. So we will lift after, generally speaking, not always. I mean, there's certain lifts that we're doing some high CNS demand stuff, we might do that first and they actually feel better uh, in practice. They feel more alert and more awake after. Yeah. Uh, any, anything that's going to be kind of tiring or exhausting, we do that always after practice uh, with the understanding. The reason why people wouldn't do that before is you'd say, well, but after practice, they're tired and they can't lift as much. Yeah, but that's, that's okay. Who cares? That's not the point. The point is to get better at what's on the ice. So I think do the most important thing first. In season, though, however, I would say, we traditionally, uh, as a team, when I was in the league, we lifted, you know, after games. And I can tell you that, you know, at that time, and, you, you know, you, as you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs used to be kind of, we used to run the show a little bit. And we, we played at home on Saturday night, almost always. It was almost always hockey night in Canada. Toronto was at home. So I knew that, it, you know, probably three, three weeks a month, we're going to be home on Saturday night. Now, is it the optimal time for lifting? Absolutely not. But I know everybody's there, right? I'm not worried about some guy getting caught in traffic or is, you know, kids sick or whatever. I know that everybody's there. I know they're warmed up. I know they got no excuse there. You know, they got their gym clothes on underneath, underneath their, uh, their hockey uniform. So I've eliminated most of the big excuses. They're all there. Uh, and you know, some days you, you, you rode that wave of excitement after a big win and guys use that adrenaline. Some days, you know, it was not such a great night and guys are pissed off and you, road that energy into the gym and make sure they don't do anything silly and hurt themselves. But you, uh, that worked for us. So I don't, and, and, and I could tell you there were guys that, you know, Gary Roberts was one and Brian McCabe and some of these guys that would routinely, we'd, we'd lift heavy, heavy, and uh, uh, not, not, not heavy ish, heavy, like heavy cleans, heavy squats before a game. And they felt better when they did that. So, wow. and some guy, and you know, if, if I did that with Alexander McGilney or Thomas Carroll, they, they would have had a terrible result because that wasn't their, their nervous system wasn't wired for that. So I don't think there's one answer that works for everybody, like, like everything else in this business. Uh, but in season, generally speaking, uh, if we were doing anything that was really kind of going to cause fatigue or drive that down, 
we're already sort of riding that cascade. They're, they've already, you know, that, that game imposed the load already that they have to recover from. We can just tack that on to, the, to that and we can really make sure we recover it the next day. Yeah, we were talking, I had Sean come on for that one for just to talk specifically about, because I actually witnessed it in Anaheim, a post-game lift. But it was only 15 minutes. What would what did your post-game lift look like if you had guys like Gary and, and McCabe in there that were, you know, one, were, was it was it just a short lift or just to kind of, you know? Oh, always short. That's the key. I mean, really, honestly, like I, I, I'm more of a, when I say high intensity, I don't, I'm not talking about hit training. That's not what I'm talking about. But I say, you know, we, we would do, one or maybe two working sets okay and depending on the time a lot of this stuff was like you know we were doing bottom-up squats or box squats or you know bottom-up single leg movements you know partial range movements floor press things like that uh again we're not it's not we're not we're not trying to you know blast through a range of motion plateaus things like that. that's that's not the time and place for that not to say it's not of value just not there uh, and not only did we did we have a, you know great results maintaining strength, we had guys that were you know getting stronger in season, which is totally possible to do. Again, these these are these are elite elite athletes with a proper warm up and proper technique. If you take one set, you know to to the failure of perfect form or failure of the velocity zone that you're that you're training in season, you don't need multiple sets. You just don't. Yeah, it's tough. All right, whoa, this has been a lot, Matt. Thank you so much for coming on. Long overdue, way long overdue. I'll remind everybody, we're going to have links to uh, Matt's uh, uh, social media, some really good stuff. I got a lot of questions off of that from today. So Matt- we'll for, our ne- for our next beach walk, we'll say those. There you go. Our long, we'll have to make a long beach walk and a candlelight dinner after that. No bingo where, uh, it's, <laughs> well, we'll let everybody know. Uh, so so we were playing, we had a bar and uh, we were drinking water. and. Um, uh, but Coach Boyle, um, we were playing bingo, believe it or not. I don't know, it was like like music bingo or something, right? I can't remember. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it was. Uh, and he won, right? He won yeah. one of them and yeah. got up and fell. Yeah. No, that was, that was yeah, that was a great memory. That was that was one of my uh, my happy pre-COVID memories when we used to actually see people in person. And uh, I know it, it was me, great. We're, we're was due great. for some music bingo then. You, me, and Mike. There you go. All right, Maddie. Take care. Thank you so much again for doing this. Always great chatting. All right, that's going to do it for episode 365 of the Shrink Coach Podcast. Guys, the show notes are located at continuefit.com or shrinkcoachpodcast.com. Don't forget, you can try the new shrinkcoach.com out for seven days for free. Go to shrinkcoach.com to check out that offer. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Huge summer sale right now. Best prices of the year on so many items. Dumbbells, bands, sandbags, plyos, pile boxes, rowers, ski trainers, kettlebells, med balls, ropes, and so much more. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Coach Nickel for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Guys, check out the anniversary interview I did with Coach Boyle. 40 mistakes, 40 years. There's a link to access that in or at shrinkcoachpodcast.com. Thanks to AG1 from Athletic Greens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strengthcoach and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. That's going to do it for this episode. Guys, as always, thanks for listening. My name's Anthony Renna, and I'll speak to you next time.